For any bottom fisherman who loves to put fish on the table, the opening of summer flounder season, or fluke as they are better known to most anglers, is a time to cherish. On this occasion, I was to meet up with good friend and captain, BJ Sylvia, of Flippin' Out Charters. I fished with BJ before on an episode of On The Water TV, catching big striped bass in and around Block Island. But on today's show, we were targeting doormat fluke we would bring home for the dinner table. We're gonna be heading to the upper bay right now and going around, we're gonna head down the Sakana River. Um, we'll pretty much be doing a whole uh, island tour by the time we're done today. Having pushed off the docks on the west side of Quidneck Island out of Portsmouth, Rhode Island, we would steam north under the Mount Hope Bridge, loop up around the northern point of Quidneck before making our way under the Sakonet River Bridge, setting up for a drift closer to the mouth of the Sakonet River. All right, well, we just got here. We're just off of Sakonet Point. Wind's not quite where BJ likes it, but we got our incoming tide, so we're gonna see if the tide can't help us. We're gonna do a little jigging right now, just to- uh, right off the bottom. Yeah, make it, a, a fluke can only watch this so many times before he lunges at it. This squid we have, we spent all night catching it, so. Uh, and we'll save the big ones uh, purposely for fluke bait. Guys, these are all freshly caught right here. There you go. Black sea bass. We're going to catch a ton of these today, I can tell you that right now, because we can't keep them. So, now what's the season down here in Rhode Island for them? Opens up in July, but we, we get our share of the quota in September, which for me, I like that because it keeps me going from September. My last charter last year was uh, Christmas, a uh, week before Christmas. Yeah. And uh, we had, I think, 30 sea bass that day. Got to look at your fish finder when you're marking stuff on the bottom, you know, marking bait. These fish are, when I'm having my best days, they're puking up sand eels, they're puking up whole squid. Uh, and you don't venture too far from those areas. Here we go. Here we go. He's bouncing the head a lot. Hopefully we crack in the ice here. All right, well, we're out here doing some black sea bass. <laughs> <laughs> black sea bass went off a new port. Catch and release. That's a slob. One thing when you're bottom fishing, you never know what you're gonna get. That's a beautiful black sea bass. It's a male. You can see it's got a big hump head right in here. I sure would love to eat that one, BJ, Ooh. but just down here in Rhode Island right now, I'm sitting here on June 10th, 11th. This guy's gotta go back. Gotta go back. If it was in Massachusetts, he'd be on the grill. <laughs> Whoa, can it be? It, yes, it is. <laughs> there we go. That's what we came for. I call that the Roland Martin uh, flipping the boat right there. That's that, let's keep drifting. Now when you do this type of trolling in and out of gear for fluke, power drifting, you gotta keep a heavy, heavy lead on. That, the mistake people make is they have light lead on because there was no drift that day, and then they start power drifting, but your lead, you'll come, your rig will come right off the bottom if you don't keep a heavy amount on. So we're running with a minimum of eight ounces right now. Eight ounces, just, and, it's, and we're pulling it off a little bit. There he is. This sounds a little, this feels a little better. See, the bigger sea bass are the real deal. There he is. Oh, there he goes. That's what we came for. You know, they turn that sideways and they come up like a, uh, like a and parachute. You, and you hooked them nice. See that big hook? Look at that, beautiful fish. That guy's gotta be right there, huh? Oh, he's, oh he keeps all day, that's a 20 inch fish. Bigger than that. That's a beautiful fish right there. Guys, that right there is a great eating fish, real white fish. We don't have a lot of wind right now, which is surprising because all spring it's been blowing hard. The current's not really pulling us along either. It's so not doing anything. What's happening is that BJ's going to head and put the boat in and out of gear, and he's going to create the current. He's going to create the wind by covering more water, and that's what we just picked up this guy. Yeah, let's see how let's get him linked on him. 22, it's almost 22 and a half. All right, let me show you how to bleed this fish. One poke right here. And you're gonna know when you hit it. You see that? 
I hit the spot. So he's gonna bleed out. We keep belly down, belly up, I mean. With so many great fluke spots off the Newport coast, BJ made the decision to pick up and head to another area just south of Newport, known to him to hold fish. So BJ, we got a little lull in the action right now. We got three rods out. So with this break, I want to go up with some of the rigging that we're doing. I know you've been making your rigs for a while. You've always been kind enough to kind of slide me a couple of them when I see you at the shows. And they've always produced. First started making this hook, I had a probably a 4 hook. Then I went to a 5 -0, Then I went to a 6 -0. I eventually went up to a 7 odd hook, which is a big, big hook. And there's a couple of reasons for this big hook. There's a big gap back in there. So you have a, the barb can penetrate the fish, fish's mouth without getting bait bunched around the bar. Yeah, right. So it can sit down into the crest of the hook right there. This one's a Mylar with two spinners on it. Back in the day when we, we did a lot of commercial fishing, this water wasn't that clean. So every advantage I could take. Create a little extra color. Yeah, a little shine, the blade spinning. Your mom was the one that actually got you involved in fishing. Yes. And she actually helps out with the, with the, with the company. She's retired now, and she always sits out in my garage, and she puts them all together for me. And I come home, tie the three ways on, I tie the, the hook on, then she packages them up for That's me. That's awesome that mom worked yeah. with you that way. And I know you said she was a big influence as far as getting you involved with oh, fishing earlier. Oh, on. absolutely. She was, uh, take me to the tackle shop. My cousins owned the tackle shop, the Breen's Bait and Tackle in Middletown, right by Frosty Freeze, which is a famous ice cream shop. Ever since they owned that tackle shop, it's all I wanted to do was fish. As and, long uh, as the bait never got mixed in with the ice cream. No, 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 we did bait first, <laughs> ice cream second. Hopefully the wind picks up, BJ, and we get on some fish. Mom, you did a good job with BJ. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. You did a good job. <laughs> All right, let's get after it. All right. There's a contour right here, but sometimes we pull our better fish off. So I'm constantly adjusting. As he puts it into gear, I might let it back a little bit so I can stay in touch with it. As soon as he pulls it out of gear, I'm going to give it a, a little bit of a reel up, and then I'm going to find that bottom and just stay on it. And that's where these fish are hanging. Right there. I think this might be another fluke. It feels like that. What BJ was saying earlier is you got a single hook on there and you can you can create a pretty good sized hole in the fish's mouth if you get them right in the corner. So the more pumping you do, the better chance you have popping that fish off. So right now, going ahead, I'm gonna bring him up. Right over to you. This guy might be a little, she just might be right there. Oh, he's there. They're all there. Beautiful fish. Let me go ahead and grab you that You know, my guy. mentality of commercial fishing all my life. You're free in free sport, you got yep, it. Yep, to get this one with right back out. This is what we came for, a beautiful fluke. Seemed to be picking up at that, moving the boat and covering water. They're here, at least we know they're, they're here. Uh, so we got two keepers, let's get this guy back in the box. You know when those things are born, they have one eye on each side. As they mature, the eye rotates all the way around, so they have the two eyes on the one side. There he is, right there. There he is. Let me get down to the sea bass, though. Double up. We'll put this one back because he's a baby compared to Chris's. Look at this. We're going to let this guy back in. DJ had gotten some fresh squid, I like coming up about an inch from the top, splitting it down the center, and just by that little fork tail, we get that much more action on it. Tight. What do you think now, Cap? That looks a little decent. Wait, BJ. That's a nice fluke. Yeah. You have a neck, doesn't it? Yeah, I'll grab the neck. That's a nice one. Just slide it right out. Here you go. That's take nice. I'm going to take this nice bubble knife here. Take this. Stick them right here. Boom. Lead them out. Lead Look them at out. that. That hit the yeah. spot quick. Boom. 
Nice, DJ. 3 1. I was trying to close the door the whole time. Boy, just get that little peck in a way, and you just take one quick swing at him. I don't think this guy's big, and we're getting fish on a steady basis right now. That's how you spit a hook. It was undersized, so it was great just leaving it in there. And he just kept regurgitating, regurgitating, and bam, third or fourth time he dropped it out. I'm gonna go ahead and drop this one back in. Travel across the magnificent Newport Suspension Bridge to reach the coastal city of Newport, Rhode Island, located on Aquidneck Island in the center of Narragansett Bay. This charming New England enclave, known as America's first resort, has evolved over time from a prominent colonial era port that played an important role in New England's maritime trading and naval history to a summer playground for rich and famous families to a year-round tourism destination celebrated for its culture, history, and beautiful waterfront. Newport's most popular landmarks is its mansions, extravagant summer cottages built at the height of the American Gilded Age in the early 1900s when Newport was a summer resort town for the nation's wealthiest families. Many of the mansions are now open to the public and allow tours of their elaborate ballrooms and dining halls. But it's Newport's natural riches, the spectacular waterfront, beautiful beaches, and access to Narragansett Bay that have made the city a popular destination for today's summer vacationers. And the waters of Narragansett Bay, which used to host large fleets of U.S. naval warships, are now patrolled every summer by hundreds of sailboats and yachts of all sizes. Whether you're a sailor or a fisherman, if you love the water, you'll love visiting Newport. Well, one thing is when the conditions aren't exactly perfect, which they're not today, we don't have a, a lot of moving water with the current. We don't have a strong wind to kind of move us along. You got to kind of create that. Got to adapt, right? You got to adapt. But you know what, though, BJ? Bumping it in and out of gas produced already. Yeah, it's we, working. And we picked, we've caught a lot of fish. We've and got we, three nice keepers in there, and the day's still early. And we know the wind's going to kick up. Right. So it's, it's just a matter of time. There we go. That feels a little better. That feels like, you know, you're getting the head shakes, but it feels like a little bit more size to it. Here we go. That's a keeper, isn't it? Oh, yeah. A little smaller than the 22, but that's still a keeper right there. Got it. <laughs> He's 18 and a half, so he makes it. About a fifth or sixth fish of keeper size. Keeper size here in Rhode Island right now fishing is over 18 inches. We've got a couple of 22s. All right, so that's our rig. We've got a three-way swivel. Big snap on there so I can put on an eight ounce. You got a spinner all the way down to a nice teaser. Oh. There you go. They're here. Look at the sea lice on them. I just saw that on the other side, huh? We've gotten seven or eight of these. You know, that's a good sign though to see those things here. You know, that's the future yeah. right there to see those fish. Oh, come on now. That guy hooked on the drop back. It was funny, he was just tapping away at it. Here he is. Only 22s. Only 22s. This guy's a little smaller than 22. It's funny, this guy gave it a tap, tap, tap. He's probably closer to 20, this guy, huh? And he was just, and then all of a sudden, I just dropped it back down and he picked it up. I'm thinking this drip will maybe worth one more. And this, these spots out here can hold, like you said, it can hold a couple of fish, or it can hold a ton of fish. When you're picking up two, three, four adrift, you know there's a lot of fish in there. Oh, I got one tap and there he is. There he is. There you go, BJ. I we... just had to tap myself a Did second you? ago. All right, nice and easy with the rod. I'm letting the rod bend, let the rod do the work. I'm gonna just nice and easy reel. 
Let him do the, you can feel right away the head shakes. You know he's a fluke. You see him yet? Oh yeah, beautiful looking fish. Oh, beautiful. Nice fish. You know what, you want to just grab him without the net? Yeah, we'll flip him right in. We got a lot of those today, so. Yeah. Oh, right. gorgeous. That's a beautiful fish right there. You got him buttoned right in the corner. Great set. Nice. You got him? Yep, got him. Take him. Yep. We've had at least half a dozen in that area, that 20 to 22 inch. Just a beautiful fish. Now, when they talk about doormats, the doormat being the real big fish, where in your estimation do the doormats begin? Four. Four pounds? Four or five pounds, yeah. And what are we looking at? Three, three and a half? Yeah, yeah. So we're just shy of a doormat. Oh, a Joe. We like to call him a Joe when they get over four. At the end of today's show, what we're going to try to do is we're going to go ahead and fillet some of these fish. And then what we're going to do after that is we're going to bring the fish back to Falmouth. We're going to do a little cooking the catch segment. We're going to show you two different ways to cook these fish. Both of them are delicious. in for my trip. I'm going to teach you guys how to do a little filleting on fluke. It seems a little tricky, but it's actually pretty simple. You got the uh, little line that goes right down the middle of the fish right there. So what I do is I like to take the knife, just go straight down it like that, nice and straight. Just make a nice like straight line like that. Then you turn the fish sideways, fall right along the rib kind of, kind of the skeleton bone structure here. And you pull back at the same time, keeping your blade flat. Nice, nice and smooth and peel back as you're doing it. Well, uh, there's one fillet. And once you get the, uh, once you get one side off, the other side's a little bit easier. The ideal way to skin is just keeping that knife at that perfect angle where it, it takes off the meat, but doesn't dig into the, the actual skin. Nice looking fillet right there. With the fillets on ice, it was time to say goodbye to Newport and head back to Cape Cod to cook our catch with Andy Nebreski. We just had a great day out there on the water fishing with BJ Sylvia. Andy, you're the resident expert when it comes to cooking, definitely not me. What are we gonna be doing today? Uh, I'm gonna show you a couple different recipes today. The first one is a very simple, basic, yet delectable uh, New England baked flounder. And then I'm also gonna be preparing a corn and apple stuffed flounder, which is a little bit more sophisticated, but it's worth the extra work. This is gonna be for the apple and corn stuffed flounder fillets. So we're gonna start just by cutting right through the center about halfway down. Be careful not to go all the way through the fillet. Turn your knife horizontal. And we're just gonna carefully work this back Go slow, take your time. Make sure you don't puncture all the way through. We're just gonna repeat that on the second side. And this is gonna form a nice pocket. Here you go, it's a butterfly flounder filet. Now we're gonna make the stuffing for our corn and apple stuffed flounder. We'll start just a little olive oil on the pan. We're gonna saute our onions. We're gonna need one ear of corn and one apple. In goes the corn and the apple that we diced up. Now it's gonna take about five minutes. After that point, the apples are gonna start kind of softening up and that's when the stuffing will be ready. Now we're just gonna add in about a quarter of a cup of dry white wine. So we'll add in about a tablespoon of melted butter. Give that a nice stir. And we're gonna add our breadcrumbs. Give that a stir, turn off the heat. We're gonna take those butterfly flute fillets and we're gonna put about a quarter of a cup of our stuffing in there. You don't wanna overstuff it because it will expand a little bit as it's cooking. We're just gonna seal that guy up like a burrito and place it cut side down on a metal baking dish. Now we're just gonna hit these with a little dusting of salt and pepper and just a quick little drizzle of olive oil. We have our oven preheated to 400 degrees. We're gonna cook these for anywhere from 10 to 14 minutes uh, until they start to flake and get a little bit browned on the top. This is a very simple yet delectable New England baked flounder. Uh, this is a recipe I've been eating since I was a little kid. It's one of my favorites. This is like comfort food to me. All right, we're gonna start this off by making some cracker crumbs. Just open up the top of the sleeve. I'm just gonna put our hand on there. Lay into it on the countertop. So you're gonna to wanna to use a ceramic pan for this, not a metal pan. If you go with a metal pan, chances are you're gonna end up burning your cracker crumbs. I'm just gonna take these, lay a thin layer inside the pan, just enough to almost cover the bottom of the pan. Now we need some butter. The juice of half a lime to that. We're also gonna jazz that up with a 
A couple of hits of Frank's Red Hot Sauce. Not a lot, we don't want this to be a spicy dish. The hot sauce does give it a nice little undertone of heat. We'll drizzle just a little bit of that in the first layer of breadcrumbs. And now we're gonna lay our beautiful fluke fillets on that bed of cracker crumbs. Good rule of thumb is when you're cooking thinner fillets like this, we're just gonna tuck that underneath and that's gonna give us an equal thickness throughout the fillet. Right, we've got our fillets placed in the pan on top of the breadcrumbs. We're just gonna hit them with just a very light coat of salt and pepper. Just a little bit more butter, melted butter on top. And some more Ritz cracker crumbs onto the top. You wanna make sure you get them evenly coated. And another quick drizzle of the butter mixture. And another thin layer of the cracker crumbs. For this recipe, you want to get your oven nice and hot. I like to go as hot as it'll go. We got this bad boy up to 500 degrees. I also like to move the rack up to the very top position that helps it brown on the top of the dish. Fire that tray in there, and that'll take about 10, 12 minutes. It should be nice and golden brown on top, and we'll pig out on it. started a column and Andy actually spearheaded called Living Off the Land and Sea and he's done, a, he's done an amazing job with that. Thank you. you yeah, we're, uh, we're very lucky to have such abundant seafood around us and uh, it's really, you know, not that hard to find a good meal uh, if you just know where to look and fluke is one of my all-time favorite fishes to eat. Thanks for bringing it to us. If you'd like to learn more about today's show, log on to onthewater.com. From Andy Nebreski, Chris Megan at On The Water, we hope you enjoyed the show. I'm going to dig in. Let's this eat. is the one time that I think the camera guys like being cameramen. <laughs> they actually <laughs> get to enjoy this. Three plates for them.